Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. It's a funny race. You can't find it on the ballot anywhere. The winner will end up with very few real powers, but those who covet the office have raised almost a million dollars for the race. The voters of only one municipality have a voice in the decision, but symbolically, the mayor of Cincinnati is the one office that has some potential to serve as a rallying point for the region. In theory, any of 18 candidates could end up in the mayor's chair after next Tuesday. But the common wisdom is there's really a two or three person race between Roxanne Qualls and Phil Heimley. This morning, each of these candidates will join me to discuss their hopes for the next two years. I am joined by the sitting mayor of Cincinnati, Roxanne Qualls. Sam, welcome back to Newsmakers. Thank you, Dan. You know, cynical, nasty little pundits like me <laughs> always are talking about the mayor of Cincinnati running around cutting ribbons. It's a weak mayor system. I've noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> Why does it matter who's mayor of Cincinnati? Well, it matters is because the mayor of the city of Cincinnati really is a rallying point for both the city and the region. Uh, whoever holds that office in terms of basically their approach to the office, the values that they betray as, uh, and uphold, as well as um, their sense of vision of the future, I think is what people uh, believe is communicated to the rest of the region, the state, as well as the rest of the country when they look at Cincinnati. When, no matter who's elected, mm -hmm. no matter who's mayor, Cincinnati is going to face a series of issues. Oh, sure. Could you identify maybe one or two that you think this city is going to have to face in the next six to eight months or something like that in the near term we can kind of see uh, that are important that no matter who's in there and how you think they ought to be handled? Well, I think one very clear issue which we will face will be uh, when the mediation which is occurring between the city and the African-American community uh, mediated by the Department of Justice, the recommendations will come back. And City Council and the Mayor are going to have to uh, either support or change the recommendations of that process. I think it's very important given the state of uh, police community relations in the city of Cincinnati. I think that there are people who feel very strongly on both sides of the issue. However, I think that it is very clear that changes are going to have to be made. And what do you, at this point, I know you don't know what the recommendations are, do you have a feeling about what should happen to improve police community relations? Well, I think there's one fundamental change that has to happen. Uh, the African American community, uh, many members of it, have very little confidence and some have absolutely no confidence in the police's ability to investigate themselves and come up with fair results. They have no confidence in the Office of Municipal Investigation. Uh, I agree with them. The Office of Municipal Investigation refers to the internal affairs of the police department matters to be investigated because they have no staffing and really have no independent powers. I think that there should be a civilian review panel established that should be empowered and that should have staffing and also uh, in a limited number of circumstances have subpoena powers. Do you think there's much support for that? on council right now or if is that position that we need a different type of review panel is that going to be controversial? I think that will be very controversial and I think that um, that there will probably be some very strong opinions by members of the police division in opposition to that but I think that we very have clearly saw after the killing of Mr. Lorenzo Collins the level of um, mistrust and distrust on the part of a significant segment of our community in the ability of the city as well as the police to actually render fair decisions. Um, and I think that you cannot in the long run have a healthy city with that lack of confidence and that credibility gap. Uh, for many of us our age we understand the impact of a credibility gap on governments as well as office holders. That's an issue that's going to come up no matter who's mayor. That's exactly right. If you're mayor, mm -hmm. what sort of initiative or proposals, direction might be there that wouldn't be there if somebody else was mayor? What is it that you would bring that might be different and special? Well, I think that um, what I would bring is uh, in many ways a reflection of what I've brought, which is a real uh, basic attention to fundamentals, whether it's long-term fundamentals like increasing home ownership or transit for the city and the region such as the light rail corridor or if it's just a basic understanding of uh, 
that you have to clean up neighborhoods and go after absentee landlords if you're actually going to try to fight crime. Uh, it's not just a matter of police. But what's really clear to me, and I'll just be real honest with folks, and I've talked with some council members about this, is that I help lead the fight for the stadiums. I've been very supportive of downtown revitalization and development. I've been very concerned about the riverfront. Those things will continue. But in this next term, this council, in terms of its budget, has to get back to the basics and to the neighborhoods. And what I am going to advocate and advocate is that uh, we do not look at any more big projects in this next budget, but that we look at the fundamentals, trash cans and business districts, finding out and uh, finding the money, which we have, if we reorder priorities to actually catch up on street maintenance, looking at improving uh, our real share of housing growth in the region, which means shifting more money into housing and home ownership opportunities, because in the long run, those are the things which are going to actually determine the quality of life in this city. You know, we've stabilized some critical things. I think we're going in the right direction with downtown, and I'm very proud of my role and all that. But, you know, now that is moving forward, and we have to, not just with rhetoric, turn our attention to really reordering the budget priorities. And I don't mean just by giving special mm -hmm. little grants to every neighborhood group, but I mean real fundamental shifting of priorities. Not to shift away from that directly, because mm -hmm. sure. that, that is a theme that I think is important. But one of the themes that you struck four years ago when you first became mayor and that you reiterated and mm -hmm. said is a value of yours is cooperation across governmental lines, yes. thinking regionally, acting regionally, mm -hmm. particularly as it relates at home between city council and county commissioners. I know that's a value for you that you've cared about, yet it seems like over the last six, eight months we've ended up fighting oh, sure. about riverfront development, mm -hmm. about sewers. Yep. Where are we on this cooperation? Are, have we taken some steps backwards? Or is there, are you less hopeful? Are you more hopeful? We need a new approach? Where are you on that? Well, a couple things. One, I'm very hopeful. Regional cooperation is a phrase. We are already cooperating on a region uh, in some very major projects. The I-71 corridor. Every political jurisdiction along the corridor has been working for three years to bring what will be the most significant regional project to fruition. Um, hopefully we will find the $380 million from the federal government next year when Congress finally acts on uh, transportation legislation. But um, with the city and the county, we have some very important projects um, and we have some differences of opinion. Cooperation doesn't mean that you're always in total agreement. And I think that anybody who understands relationships understands that that's not what cooperation means. But I also think that very clearly some of the tension between the city and the county is not about the specific issues. It's about shifting relationships, shifting power, shifting centers of population, shifting resources. And the city and the county, quite frankly, do have to learn how to deal with each other in ways which they have not dealt with each other in the past as equals, but with the county having a greater ability to do things than historically they have had. The county has become more of a center of real power and real action than it was 10 years ago. Oh, very or uh, even five years ago, very clearly. And that's very different. There used to be only one player in, in Hamilton County in the sense of, of a political jurisdiction with the resources and the population to make things happen, and that was the city of Cincinnati. Well, that's no longer the case. And, um, you know, and when we look outside Hamilton County and you look to northern Kentucky, yes, there's tremendous growth and they're fine communities, but when you still look at resources, uh, it's still Cincinnati and Hamilton County that have the resources. When you were first running for council, way back when, and you ran way back several, when. Way several back. times before <laughs> you, you won and now you've been on for a while, you sort of were seen ori originally as sort of a grassroots mm -hmm. environmentalist, you know, yes. coming in, and you scared some people. You know, oh, you a whole were heck of a lot. A whole lot. <laughs> now it seems like you've got the support of the business community. You've got the support of the powers that be. Have you changed? Have you matured? Have you converted those people that used to be suspicious of you? What's happened? 
Well, let me expand on that list. I have the support of the business community, the powers that be, neighborhood groups, as well as still many of the, my original constituency groups. I think, I would like to think that it's uh, maturing. I think it's also being what I always was before I was elected, which was fundamentally someone who was a community organizer, understanding how to get things done and understanding how to advise people to get things done if it's in the best interests of the city. And uh, what I've really tried to do is understand the difference between being on the outside and being an elected official that has to govern and really try to use, you know, kind of basic criteria as fairness and whether or not the decision moves the city and the community forward. Um, sometimes you're not always successful, but uh, that's what I've tried to do, and I think that engenders respect. Mm -hmm. This time you have faced a situation, particularly in the last 10 months to a year, where you're mayor, but there is a coalition of five mm -hmm. council people, and we all know when there's nine, if you can count to five, you run the, you run the agenda, you run the show. Um, is that a system that this city can continue to live with where we can, can have a structure that allows our leader, the mayor, not to really be calling the shots? Well, let me answer that in two ways. One, um, I would take a bit of an exception saying that a five-member coalition um, called the shots. Uh, the Sensei Enquirer did an article talking about the accomplishments of city council. Half of the things they listed were initiatives of mine that were supported by this Council 9-0. So I think you have to be careful not to buy into the political propaganda of people campaigning for office this year. You have to actually look at the facts. Uh, the second part, I have long time said that this system has got to change. Um, and it's not just because of, you know, five votes, six votes, nine votes. It's because when you actually look at um, the issues that the city confronts, our ability to represent ourselves to state and national government, articulate issues, rally the community. Um, you have to have a directly elected mayor. Okay. Well, we'll probably come back to that after the election. Thank you for being with us this morning, and we'll catch up with you on Tuesday night. My pleasure. Okay. Stay tuned. After the break, I will be joined by Republican Council Member and Mayor Qualls Principal Challenger, Phil Heimlich. Welcome back. Phil Heimlich is completing his second term as a member of City Council. During the past year, Heimlich forged a coalition of five people, including Democrats Dwight Tillery and Manette Cooper, who effectively controlled the business of council during the all-important budget process. Two years ago, Heimlich finished second, a slim thousand votes behind Qualls, and has every intention of finishing first on Tuesday night and occupying the corner office at 8th and Plum. Welcome back to Newsmakers. Good to be here, Dan. Phil, uh, as you know, Roxanne was on the first part, and I'm going to ask some questions that are the same here. Uh, you know, people like me like to ask, comment about the, the mayor of Cincinnati running around, cutting ribbons, reading proclamations, being a weak mayor. Why is it important? Why is it, in your view, why is it worth all of this effort to become mayor when you're first, just first among equals? Well, in our system, you don't run for mayor. You run for re-election to council. Obviously, if I was elected mayor by the voters, I'd be honored. I think what the mayor can do is exercise some symbolic leadership to talk about issues like fighting crime, to talk about working out regional partnerships with northern Kentucky and the county. And I should say not just talk about it, but actually do something about it. And, and to talk about issues like education. I think that symbolic leadership is what makes the, the mayor's position here, here important. You're not trying to tell me that you're not running for mayor. In, in our system, no one, including Roxanne, runs for mayor. You run, and, and she said the same thing, we run for, for council in this system. Obviously, I am doing everything that I can to get my message out about what I've accomplished and what I think is important for the city. Yeah. Um, no matter who's elected mayor, no matter who ends up first, the city is going to face uh, some issues that will have to be confronted. What would you identify as maybe the one or two issues that you think the city's going to have to face in the next six, eight months? And how would you, if you were elected mayor, how would you think we ought to respond to those issues? Well, I, pr I think the greatest challenge we have is our region has to be able to compete on the global marketplace, and we have to be able to compete as a region. We have to work with northern Kentucky and with the county and build cooperative relationships. 
for one thing, I'd like to see us start merging some city-county functions like highway maintenance and buildings and inspections, things like that. I've been meeting with some of the leaders over in northern Kentucky to start building relationships. They have their tri-county economic development group. We have to work together or else we're going to lose jobs and businesses to Phoenix, Chicago, and other parts of the country. I think that's probably our greatest challenge. Okay. If you are elected mayor, um, you know, there's those, there's those issues which no matter who's in that office is going to have to deal with. But if you're elected as opposed to anybody else, what is it that you will bring? What sort of initiative, what sort of vision, what sort of proposal that, you know, sort of unique to you that you think you would bring to that office? I think that what's most important is not so much individual proposals, but the ability to work together with other members of council to build coalitions. As the Inquirer said last Sunday, in our system of government, a leader who cannot build coalitions cannot lead. I think being able to work together with different members of council, I, as you mentioned, have built a coalition with Dwight Tillery and Manette Cooper, Charlie Winburn, and Jeanette Sissel. We're different parties, we're different races, but we work together. In fact, I was able to, uh, I was able to keep my campaign promises of police officers in every neighborhood and a parental responsibility law through that coalition. I think the ability to work as a team, to get things done as a team, is really the most important quality that a mayor has to have and a council member has to have. Would you agree that that, that uh, coalition, though, is based on sort of uh, not just, I mean, we, we can make it sound like it's this wonderful group of five people coming together who have common values, or is it some people who have some real opposition, in this case, to Roxanne as being mayor. You and Dwight clearly sort of a coalition of convenience against someone and what happens to that after this election? Well this coalition came together for one reason and that is because we, we had issues that were important to us that we each wanted to get done. It was based on policy not politics. I wanted to get more police in our neighborhoods. I wanted to get a parental responsibility law passed which are the two things I had promised in 1995 our coalition got that done. Dwight Tillery wanted to see expanded hours at recreation centers. Minette Cooper wanted more jobs for young people. Charlie Winburn wanted the FACT program expanded citywide. Jeanette Sissel wanted to see learning centers where suspended and expelled kids could keep up with their schoolwork. These were important things. We decided to work and find common ground and get these things done and that's what we did. As far as after the election goes, I expect to continue to be working with these people. I think it's possible that other coalitions could build, but the important thing is that leadership means having the ability to work together with other members of council and to build coalitions. The, uh, the theme that you have hit on throughout your career running for council, being on council, is the need for police. That's, that's one of the themes, one of the key themes. Um, in the aftermath of the Lorenzo Collins situation and trying to figure out what has happened here. Uh, a lot of people would argue that one of the problems is that we, the police who are on the street tend to be so young and so inexperienced that our, our, our more mature officers end up in special units and tend not to spend much time on, on the street. How, first off, do you agree with that analysis that that's a, a, a fundamental problem we got? And secondly, how do we address that problem, which is more than just a numbers problem? Well, I do think since you had the mayor on before, had, had Roxanne on before, it is important that probably the biggest difference between Roxanne and myself is the issue of crime. I believe that fighting crime, not just adding police, but fighting crime is the most important duty of local government. And she and I are different places here. I have supported and initiated getting more police on the streets, parental responsibility law, the daytime curfew, the crime abatement district and over the Rhine. Roxanne had voted against every one of these. So she and I, I think it's important to understand, are just at completely different places on the crime issue. You, you are correct. The problem we've had in our police department, and our chief has acknowledged this, is because we've had so many retirements, our force is too young. It isn't really a question that the older guys are in the higher positions. They're just retiring and leaving the force. We have too many young officers out in the street. The best way to deal with this, and I've worked with the chief on this, is we're trying to get a program where we, we can take retired officers and essentially rehire them 
in key positions so we keep that experience on the street. We haven't been able to get the change in state law necessary to accomplish that, but it's something we need to do. One of the things that may be coming up down the road is a report back on review of police actions by a citizens group other than OMI. Um, some people have argued that OMI really just turns things over to the police, uh, argue that we need a different type of uh, review panel. Where do you stand on that? I don't really think it's fair to say that OMI has just turned things over to the police. What OMI does is when they receive complaints, they sift through them. The ones that they don't think are of any merit, they just turn back and let the police handle it through their internal processes. OMI has been quite vigilant, actually, in working and focusing on police misconduct. In fact, over the years, they've almost always come out differently than the police do on evaluating police misconduct. So I don't really think that's true about OMI. If they need more funding, let's give them more funding. I'm not convinced at this point that a civilian review board is the answer to this problem. Okay. One of the things that you've hinted at earlier in your comments is the need to work together across governmental lines. Uh, the county commissioners have, have been controlled by the Republicans for decades. Uh, if you were the mayor, you'd be a Republican. Would that make a difference? Would you be able to work with people on the other end of Court Street better than someone else who wasn't a Republican? And secondly, in real concrete ways, which you sort of spin out, you began to hint at some of these things, some concrete things that you would change about that relationship. Well, let's not even talk about the future. Let's just look at what's happened in the last term. The mayor has talked about regionalism, but every time an issue has come up, she's immediately attacked the county and essentially declared war on them. For example, with the issue over indirect charges, the MSD bills and charges about that. I've stood up to the county where it's been necessary, for example, on the issue of the Bengal Stadium swallowing up the riverfront. But I have been urging our council, and Dwight and I and our coalition have kind of led the way in seeking a more uh, friendlier relationship, a working relationship with the county. I meet regularly with Bob Bettinghouse and the other commissioners, and there are actually a number of things we were able to even work out behind the scenes. For example, the way the indirect charges issue got settled was we chose a mediator that worked it out between the city and the county. That was actually something that Bob and I talked about and worked out behind closed doors. It wasn't something we all stood up in front of the cameras and took credit on. But I think that's a good example of how we can work with them and not constantly get into a war of words with the county. Okay. Um, given that you mentioned also, because you, you've also been a proponent besides the police thing, you've been a pr proponent of managed competition. Mm -hmm. Is that also a piece of, you, you talked about maybe merging some departments between the county and the city uh, around managed competition? Well, managed competition is a, is a vital thing for our city. Cities that are moving forward, that are growing, that are developing jobs like Indianapolis and Charlotte, they are using managed competition. It's essential. And it's no excuse to say, well, I'm a Democrat uh, or a Democratic mayor can't support that because Ed Rendell in Philadelphia, John Norquist in Milwaukee, Mike White in Cleveland, all Democrats, all have had the courage to stand up to the big labor unions and fight for the citizens to have quality services. Managed competition is a key difference between Roxanne and myself. She came out in her first term and said, we need managed competition for city services. We need competition. But every time it's come to a vote, she's voted against it. She's basically uh, given up the taxpayers of the city and supported the big labor unions. The, the vote on parking garages, we could have saved 370000 a year, but unfortunately a majority of council voted against it. Trash collection, again, six members of council refused to do what was right and allow competition for that. That is an absolutely key issue for this city. It, the, the issue, as far as merging city county, county functions, that nece doesn't necessarily relate to managed competition, but it's an example of regional cooperation. Okay. We're going to be running out of time, so thank you very much, and we'll catch up with you on Tuesday night and see how things turn out. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. The Hamilton County Board of Elections is predicting that just 45 percent of the registered voters will turn out on Tuesday. That's 2 percent lower than in 1995. The most honorable position in any democracy is not president or mayor or any other elected office. It is citizen. Being a citizen means playing an active role in the public life of the community. 
Voting is only the most basic activity related to that role, but an essential one. Go to the polls and take your children with you. It's the most effective teaching you can do about the significance of democracy in our collective lives. If you live in Hamilton County or in many parts of Claremont County, Kids Voting will allow your children to cast ballots as well. And be sure to join Channel 12 on Tuesday night for the best election coverage in the Tri-State. Thanks for being with us.